Our guests for the next hour are Walter Cohn, a partner with Obermeyer, Redman, Maxwell, and Hippel. He had also served as acting attorney general in 1995. Bill Kiesling, writer for Newslink.com and author of several books on corruption in Pennsylvania state government, including Sins of Our Fathers and We All Fall Down. And joining us from our Pittsburgh bureau, Dennis Roddy, member of the firm Cold Spark Media and a former special assistant to Governor Tom Corbett. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us. Um, yesterday, the Senate special, com the special committee on Senate address held a hearing to determine whether the attorney general could fulfill her duties in office with a suspended law license. Uh, Walter, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on what happened in the proceeding yesterday? I thought actually that both the chief of staff to uh, Kathleen uh, Kane, Jonathan Duker, and uh, Ed Rendell, former governor. I thought that they really laid out the issues very clearly. Uh, they, they were sort of trying to, the, the Senate was kind of trying to uh, really push them on some issues, which is the natural give and take of that kind of procedure. But uh, I think in the end, the most important uh, issue to come out of that, I think, was the way Governor Rendell set forth the balance between a policy decision made by an attorney general or a district attorney and a legal decision. And One example I would give very quickly of the kind of policy decision that Kathleen Kane has made in the past that I think she could still make today even with a suspended law license was the decision, a very courageous one at the time, not to defend this ban against same-sex marriage that had been passed by the General Assembly here. She wasn't going to defend it. Uh, that was a policy decision. There was no law. The Supreme Court hadn't ruled yet. But she made that decision and probably got the legal analysis from some of her very competent deputies. Uh, but in the end, uh, you're not making a legal decision when you're deciding how you think the Supreme Court a year later might rule on uh, a very important social issue. And I, I think Ed Rendell laid that out very clearly, and I would use that as an example to to really say that I believe that she can continue to do the kind of work that she has been doing, that she was doing before her license was suspended, uh, in her job as Attorney General. Bill, I believe I saw you in attendance at the hearing yesterday. What are your thoughts on, on the tone? How would you describe the tone of the interaction between the senators and the testifiers? I thought it was appalling. I, you know, I really did. I thought it was embarrassing. Uh, Skinner, Senator uh, Scarnati was embarrassing. I think he popped off. And he kept saying, and, and this goes to Walter's point about policy versus law, he kept saying, can we do this direct removal? Well, you can do a lot of things in life. The question, and I think what Governor Rendell was saying, should you do it? You know, they're basically saying, we've got this gun cabinet. They're not, they don't know much about the history of what this provision is and what it's for. And I also thought that they were really browbeating the chief of staff. You know, the guy was there to do, his, to do a job. And I was really embarrassed for the Pennsylvania Senate. And I was embarrassed for, for everyone in, for, in a free society because I don't think, I, 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 I really think we should be talking about the due process of law, the presumption of innocence. And there's a broader scandal here with Ms. Kane involving the pornographic emails, the, the Supreme Court and everything like that. And the limited to this discussion, which they kept insisting on a law license, is repugnant. You know, and it's beneath the Senate. So I was embarrassed. Let's head to our Pittsburgh Bureau. Dennis, what did you take from the hearing yesterday? What I took from the hearing is that the uh, members of the Senate uh, drew a very sensible distinction between what, um, what, what uh, happens uh, in an impeachment, which is a removal uh, for a specific cause or misbehavior, and a Senate removal clause, which is removal for a disability. And I'm sure Bill will get into some of the history of that. But uh, ultimately, uh, what we're talking about is, is, is people who drew, uh, I think, uh, the proper distinction uh, as, as to what is to be examined here. Kathleen Kane is the Attorney General of Pennsylvania. The position of Attorney General, if you want to run for Attorney General, you have to be a licensed attorney. If you lose that, it doesn't simply devolve to a matter of policy because the policy decisions you make are policy decisions about how and where and what and under what circumstances a certain law will be practiced. Uh, I mean, her decision not to not to defend the state as its lawyer in the in in in, in the uh, uh, gay marriage case is simply embodied to someone. Uh, uh, deciding to ditch their client and then rent a hall and hold a rally to make the announcement. 
uh, if that's if that's if that's policy, well, uh, policy be damned. I, I also think it's a decision about the law and when to practice it. And for that, you need to be a lawyer. See, I, I think Dennis has hit upon what I would describe as a real problem here because. He doesn't like that decision because he doesn't like the policy, so he is going to say, well, you know, she really, as Attorney General, she has to follow the law. There was no real law other than that she can uh, delegate uh, legal issues to the governor. And what she was saying is, I don't believe the uh, same-sex marriage uh, statute prohibition uh, should exist, so I can't defend it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Governor, Thorn G Go Governor Corbett can defend it uh, because he supports it, just like Dennis supports it. Well, you cannot impeach somebody because you don't like uh, the policy directions that they take. And that's not a legal issue. It was purely a policy decision based upon thinking in this society where we are in uh, uh, then 2014, I guess it was, uh, not, uh, uh, not where we were, and projecting what might happen a year later when the Supreme Court takes the case. Let's take a look. Uh, Governor Ed Rendell was one of the testifiers at yesterday's hearing. Let's see what he had to say. And then you'd have the Senate throwing her out and the Supreme Court reinstating her license. What would, what would the law be on that? Who would decide what happens next? It would add to the chaos. Guy, uh, guys, uh, senators, impeach her. I, if your main complaint is the way she has conducted herself in office, impeach her. Don't use this method. So Governor Rendell refers to the impeachment process. Walter, you start to delve into the difference between the two. What is more appropriate, if anything, um, to utilize under the current circumstances? Well, what the Senate is really supposed to be looking at is whether she is able to do the job of attorney general with a suspended license. Uh, she is a member of the bar under suspension. Uh, the Supreme Court, in their ruling <coughs> suspending her license, says this does not remove her from office. So the Senate now has this process that they're looking at in order to remove her from office. But you cannot remove somebody from office uh, because you don't like uh, the direction of what they're they're doing. And, and I think that's a large part of the political problem here that underlays this whole discussion. Dennis, would you like to add to this um, regarding impeachment versus direct address? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, fa it's fairly simple. Impeachment is there uh, for when somebody it does something wrong. And they don't have to be convicted in the court of law first. You hold a Senate trial. You determine that. That would have easily been the preferable course to take. I mean, uh, uh, that's, that's something that, that I said all along would be the actual way for this state to proceed. But uh, this state and its legislature proceed ponderously, glacially. The disability that exists is the fact that she doesn't have a law license. And it simply is, it, it flies in the face of all common sense to say that an attorney general without a law license is not disabled from fully serving and properly serving. Otherwise, why do we have that requirement? I mean, why don't we just let anyone who can pass a notary public uh, test uh, uh, become the attorney general? Uh, how about me? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm fully unqualified in the law. We need an attorney general that, that has a law license. I mean, when she was running for election, October 21st, 2012, during her debate with David Freed, she talked about how she would uh, when the moment called, go in and prosecute cases personally. These were whole, her own words. This is a far cry uh, from, from what the voters uh, elected, uh, a fully qualified attorney with a license. Bill? Well, I hope we can get into the history of the provision. No, it's, it's not appropriate. Uh, you know, 22 other states don't have the requirement that you be a member of the bar. You don't have to be a licensed member of the bar to be the U.S. Attorney General or a member of the U.S. Supreme Court. The term of art in most constitutional papers is learned of law. It's not 
member of the law. What it, what it says here, Article 4, Section 5 of the state constitution, I thought I'd just read it. No person shall be eligible to the office of attorney general except a member of the bar of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Well, you know what? She is a member of the bar. So it, it's, it's false. But I think there's a deeper problem here because an impeachment trial would bring in all this other stuff. She'd be able to defend herself. The people of Pennsylvania would have a much better idea of what this, what this thing is about, which is not just about Kane's law license. They're upset about a whole host of other issues. And I think that's what Ed says. You're upset about her conduct, not her law license. So it's disingenuous. It's dishonest. And they don't even know the history of the provision, which is really crazy. It's not about an inc incapacitation like this. It's about a physical or mental incapacitation and things that don't rise to the level of misconduct, which this clearly does. So there's a whole slew of problems with it. What kind of precedent exists currently? What do we know about this procedure of direct address? The direct address procedure was put in the Constitution in 1874, and it was used twice. In 1885, a judge from Pittsburgh named Kirkpatrick, and then in, in 1891, Governor Patterson used it again against the Auditor General and the Treasurer. When they put it in the Constitution in 1874, there were two separate provisions, one for judges, which you got two-thirds vote of both houses, and then the other was for low-level uh, elected officials. And what it was meant for was uh, people like justices of the peace, aldermen. You had tree bark inspectors in the 19th century. So the thought was, how do you get rid of sick and infirm members, low-level officials, without tying up both houses of the legislature? So Patterson used it against a judge in 1885, and it turns out that the judge had a stroke, and the legislature was told he had dementia from syphilis. So they, were, they, they couldn't have known. And the point is, in, in 1874, there was no psychiatric profession. It was quackery then. So when they used it again in, in 1891, there's three interesting things that, that I've been thinking about. One is that the, the day before the hearing in 1891, the, the Attorney General went down to Philadelphia and the Governor and they conducted a hearing. There was bribery going on involving the Treasurer of Philadelphia. Do you know who was bribing the Treasurer of Philadelphia? The Philadelphia Inquirer was and other newspapers were bribing the treasurer to get legal ads. So this started the whole process. The attorney general was a fellow from Lancaster named Hensel, and he had himself been disbarred from the practice of law. He had insulted a judge. Hensel would be important to have here today with, with uh, Walter and Dennis because he owned the Lancaster Intelligencer. He was president of the Pennsylvania Editorial Writers Association. So he was a newspaper man and a lawyer. He would understand this. But he'd been disbarred for criticizing a judge in his newspaper in Lancaster, and they got it back. So I think he would have something to say about going after Kane with this procedure. It's ridiculous. And the other thing is, that on, on the day of this direct address, the governor then asked the Senate to investigate and throw out 10 magistrates in Philadelphia because he said there was a network of corruption. It wasn't just focused on a narrow issue of a mental incapacity. It, it was about broad-based corruption. And, and the Republican you know, legislature at the time, the Senate, disagreed with if, him and threw it out. But if, it's fascinating to contrast these two things because I think they would choke in 1891 if they, if they realized we were going after the Attorney General over a law license. It's ridiculous. Dennis, did you want well, to... Well, Bill, yeah, Bill, from, 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 from the people you describe uh, in 1891, I'd be, I'd be happy to see them choke. But uh, uh, let's keep something else in mind. Uh, this statute was put in, uh, in the Constitution in the 19th century when, as you say, there was no psychiatric profession. But it was also put in the Constitution in 1968 when there was a psychiatric profession and when we understood that many of the contexts in which we lived had shifted immensely, tremendously, and that we adapt ourselves and our thinking to the time in which we live, and that's one of the reasons the constitutional provisions are written broadly. So the fact that the Philadelphia Inquirer bribed a treasurer, the fact that uh, somebody misdiagnosed a stroke for dementia, all of these things really don't come to bear in terms of describing a disability. Disabilities and their meaning shift. They change with the time, and I'm saying that if 
losing your law license and for, for a position that requires you to be a lawyer is not a disability, then disabilities don't exist outside, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a, a pickaxe to somebody's head. Uh, this, this is, this is, this is a, a time in which we have to start thinking, uh, you know, in 20th and 21st century contexts as to what constitutes a disability. Lastly, I, I do want to point this out. Uh, you had, uh, you, you, you had, uh, well, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, maybe I'm disabled. Go ahead. I'll, I'll get back to it. Let's move on. Walter, go ahead, please. Well, one, uh, I, I think, point that's important to understand here is part of the reason I think that the Senate is doing this direct address process is because it is less cumbersome. It can be quicker than impeachment. And uh, I was in the uh, process as, at the time, first Deputy Attorney General when Rolf Larson, former Justice of the Supreme Court, was, uh, I, I was part of the process that investigated, uh, indicted, convicted, and sentenced him, uh, and then there was an impeachment. Uh, but the House had the sense and the understanding that you, you cannot start an impeachment process while there are criminal charges pending uh, because they're charges. You need a cause, you need a conclusion. And, and so the impeachment could not start until after she has been not just convicted, but had a judgment of sentence entered. And that's a process that will probably take place uh, in, in terms of the trial. We don't know the outcome, but that process will probably not conclude until sometime in 2017 when a new term will start for the Attorney General, whether it is Kathleen Kane or somebody else. So uh, I think that's why the Senate is trying to use this process, but I agree with uh, Bill on, on the analysis of the purpose of it. And uh, I, I disagree with Dennis on the conclusion that she is not a member of the bar. Technically, she is a member of the bar, but her license is suspended. Uh, just like a student is in school, they're, they're a member of the student body. If they get suspended from school for some purpose, they are still a member of that student body at that school. And I think that uh, that's what the Supreme Court said when it said, this does not remove her from office. So eventually, when the Senate is done, if they do proceed, this will go either by motion of the governor before he follows the direction of the Senate, or by uh, Kathleen Kane's motion after the governor would act to remove her to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania will get another chance to look at this. And we don't know what the outcome will be, because there are three new justices on the court, and there's one, uh, there are justices no longer there, plus we don't know the fate of Justice Aiken at this time. Well, and you, you asked me what I thought about the Senate hearing, but I'm sitting there, I, I was at all four hearings, and what doesn't come up at all is what was the wisdom of removing someone, of punishing someone before we had the due process of law here. And, uh, you, you know, again, it's appalling. The phrase I want to be considered innocent until proven guilty is of Pennsylvania origin. I was on a British website and they credit somebody in 1805 from Gettysburg as saying that. That's a Pennsylvania phrase. So why isn't the Senate looking at all the trouble you know, the Senate can also be doing this with judges. They can be impeaching. The House can be looking at all these people. Why aren't they looking at the turmoil in the state Supreme Court that, that led to this bad decision? And, and I think people should be asking that. Why aren't they looking at the broader problem here instead of just picking on Kathleen Kane? And the other thing I'll say is Section 3 dealing with impeachment says one of the things they can do when you're impeached is the disqualification to hold any office of honor or trust or profit under this commonwealth. Kathleen Kane can seek re-election and come back if, if, if she's victimized by this direct address. So these guys, there's a certain amount of chaos theory at play here, and they could be putting her in the governor's office by doing this. Now, uh, Walter, a moment ago uh, you, you mentioned about there being a new Supreme uh, Court now, a panel of three new uh, Democratic jurists. That being said, uh, I believe and Ed Rendell also made this case uh, during the clip that we had shown. What happens if the Committee on Direct Address recommends that she be removed, perhaps proceedings go forward that she is removed, and then they reinstate her law license? As Ed Rendell said, that's uh, chaos. And, and that's why this, this whole process has to be thought through uh, extremely carefully.
Has the court responded at this point as to what the procedure would be or when they would make a decision on whether or not to reconsider her, her license? No, and I think she just applied for that, when was that, Monday, Monday or Tuesday. And the whole timing of that, talking to the Kane people, they realized there was a new court coming in. And you know what, I think this goes to the problem we have here in Pennsylvania of mixing our politics with our justice system, that we have to wait for an election to, <laughs> to decide how we're going to go to court. And that's appalling. You know, So I think she was left with a decision, did she go to state court? Did she go to federal court and say, hey, my rights to due process, which is what, the Fifth Amendment or the Due Process Clause, Walter would know this more than me, um, you know, they've taken, they've hurt me, my right to due process, and let's get an injunction on the Senate. Well, now you see this election happen in the state court, so she decided to go to the state court. But yeah, this is total mayhem here. And, you know, just stepping back, when I started to research this stuff from the 19th century, none of these people even understood that they had used this direct address provision. So these are like a bunch of kids playing with a gun cabinet, not knowing what it's for, why it was put there, but maybe we should take it out and fire the thing. And I think, as Mr. Cohen says, it's, this has to be thought out a little bit more. And I would really like to see everybody just take a deep breath and step back. And, you know, I'm really here to say, you know, the Kathleen Kane personality stuff, I think everyone gets it. But there have to be cooler heads prevailing here, thinking about what's going on and what the ramifications are. And I think that's what Governor Rendell was talking about yesterday. Hey, guys, let's think about this for a minute. And that isn't a bad thing. Dennis, what are your thoughts? Do you think that the Senate panel should delay a decision until the courts decide about the reinstatement of her license? I think the Senate panel should go ahead. I think the Senate panel is not ad an adjunct of the court, nor the court an adjunct of the Senate. Uh, one can certainly countermand the other. Uh, most importantly, though, uh, we, we need to think in these terms. What, are this, uh, what happens as she continues? I mean, everybody talks about let's step back, take a pause, and examine this. Does anyone recognize the level of turmoil the rebel, a level of, 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 of dysfunction, uh, the fact that right now we have an attorney general who has uh, absent an, a, a valid law to do so, appointed a special prosecutor, handed over a million emails, some of which very likely or very well could contain grand jury material without uh, any any such order as required by the supervising grand jury judge, given them to a third party who himself is not licensed to practice law in Pennsylvania, and 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 clearly is is reaching uh, the point where you know if if she, if she becomes f uh, more upset at uh, the fact that uh, her enemies real and imagined might remove her from office, basically try to blow up the world like some Bond villain. I mean. Uh, this, this, uh, the dysfunction, the danger, this is what government is elected to intervene and, and call to a halt. Now, wait a minute. You know, I was searching through my papers, what Walter can talk about here. During the Larson impeachment, I, I have a subpoena, or I guess it was a letter from he appointed... Uh, you pointed at Dennis and also Tierney, Tierney. from Maine. And I, I have a letter from Maine saying, would you send stuff up, Mr. Keyes? Well, he ignored it. But you know what? I don't remember anybody saying, ah, they have, you know, you know, they've appointed these Martians from this strange country in, in Maine, wherever that is. This, is. this is ridiculous. You know, I think everybody recognized this pornographic email thing had to be examined in some independent fashion. She did it. These guys... Don't, don't want an investigation. And coming on the heels of the whole Sandusky case where they're denying that they dragged their feet, and now they're dragging their feet over the, the pornographic email thing. But, you know... Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. Come on now. We're getting into conspiracy uh, areas here. This is not about pornography. This is about perjury, Bill. She's accused of perjury. What about Walter Cohen appointing a special prosecutor from Maine? Would you have protested that? Was he licensed to practice law in Pennsylvania, Walter? No. <laughs>
No, it's no different than Doug Gansler from Maryland, and there's precedent for it, and that's really, in any event, not the issue that is before the court. Uh, she has appointed uh, several different law firms. I'm involved in a case right now where uh, Linda Kelly, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, uh, woman who succeeded by nomination of uh, Governor Corbett, succeeded uh, Corbett as Attorney General. Linda Kelly appointed Cohen Milstein, a firm in uh, no relation, firm in Washington, uh, to handle an investigation of the nursing home industry in this state. And actually, uh, uh, the Commonwealth Court has just uh, affirmed the uh, possibility that that can be done. And it is being carried forward by uh, Kathleen Kane. So uh, the, the issue of outside counsel uh, was not licensed, doing special work, uh, that's a non-issue. I mean, it's, it's been done. It has to be under the supervision of the Office of Attorney General. And that's the other point. There are literally hundreds, how a couple is, of hundred lawyers is it, in that Walter? office who are functioning. It may not be the most pleasant place, place to work, in part because of all of this chaos, but they're doing their job. Okay. I have contact with them, and uh, they continue to uh, I don't get what I want from them. That's how you can tell they're doing their job. How is it then, Walter, how is it that in the appointing document, the charging document, she says that uh, in accordance with her powers and consistent with the expired state law, which was the state law that granted this power, is, is, is yeah. it... That's if, if you're not allowed to do something, what clearer message the could there be than the fact that there was a law that allowed you to do it and it's no longer functioning? No, 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 that, no that law came in, look at, look at the dates. That law was passed after Jim Tierney and Ed Dennis completed their job and Justice uh, uh, Larson was removed. Well, it uh, was not as a result of that law, I, and that expired. And I don't know why she put it in there. Well, and, and I, I it think, has nothing to do with it. But, but I, it's I a pretty good hint. You shouldn't be doing it then. Well, I think, I think the public is really tired of the whole pornographic. <laughs> they're tired of the issue, but I think they're tired of it not being addressed properly. And I think it became quite apparent to a lot of people over the last few months that somebody from the outside had to come in and do this, that we weren't going to appoint somebody's buddy or campaign manager and have them do an independent analysis of this. And I think that's what part of the kick is against this, because they can't control Kane and they can't control some guy from Maryland. That might be a good thing. The other argument that I've been hearing is that, oh, you know, there's going to be a big blow up because Kane doesn't have a license and people aren't going to be able to, you know, their cases are going to be thrown out. Well, on Monday, the judge from Armstrong County, and this was sent to me by their defense <coughs> lawyer, says that there's, there's nothing to that, that, uh, you know, uh, Kane, uh, the temporary suspension of Ms. Kane's law license d doesn't bar her from exercising the statutory th uh, granted powers of the Attorney General. So a lot of these things yes, were thrown up by people. What they want in this state are insiders to turn a blind eye and for, for have us to keep doing what it is we've been doing. And that's the formula for disaster here. You know? ahead, the judge in the Kramer case, the judge in the Kramer case specifically said that, uh, that, that uh, her office could continue to prosecute because she is essentially disabled and Bruce Beamer's the guy in charge. So is she disabled or not? Well, per perhaps on that issue, um, Jonathan Decker, who is the Attorney General's Chief of Staff, testified at yesterday's hearing. Uh, additional top staffers testified at previous hearings. What have we ascertained uh, as to how her job may or may not have been compromised with the license suspension? I, I think that uh, it gets back to where we started, in a sense, with the question of policy versus legal decisions. Uh, as Attorney General, uh, I mean, one thing that Ed Rendell was saying is District Attorney, 98% of his work was not legal. Uh, she has said the same thing, perhaps uh, echoing what uh, something she learned from Ed Rendell. I don't agree with that analysis. I don't say it's 98%, but I think it's 85, 90%. And then when she loses, uh, the, has her license suspended for a period of time, she has to rely on Bruce Beamer and others in that office for legal advice, which uh, she probably relied on to a great extent even before that happened, but then she makes the final decision. Uh, one example I would give, and I would recall for everybody who says the magic of being a lawyer, uh, there are cabinet officials uh, who are not lawyers who make decisions all the time. 
we're going to uh, refer this matter for criminal prosecution. We're going to start this investigation. We're going to close down this facility. I was uh, Secretary of Public Welfare uh, when Dick Thornburg was governor. And when I came in, w soon after I got there, there was a decision from the United States Supreme Court saying that Judge Broderick in Philadelphia did not have the authority to order the closure of Pennhurst State Hospital. And uh, so my legal department brought it to me and said, hey, this is great. We don't have to close Pennhurst. That's what the court said. And I said, no. The court said the judge can't order it, but I'm the secretary. And I can make that a policy decision, and we're going to close Pennhurst. We closed Pennhurst. Part of that was the, the influence on issues of mental uh, health and uh, mental retardation, the influence of uh, Ginny Thornburg uh, and uh, their son, who was uh, mentally impaired. And uh, we closed Pennhurst. That's a decision that is made on a policy level that's just like the same-sex marriage ban decision, many other decisions that are made based upon a legal analysis that you get from the lawyers on your staff, of whom there are, I think, around 200. Uh, and the attorney general doesn't have to go to court. But maybe the attorney general will go to court. When I was first deputy, I, went, I argued in front of the United States Supreme Court. Ernie Prieta, as attorney general, argued in the United States Supreme Court. That was a choice. And sure, you can't do that if your license has been suspended. But, but usually that is not something the attorney general does. It's a matter of what the attorney general defines as her role here. Did, it, did it Mike Fisher, as attorney general, argue a case or two in... In court? I don't know. Maybe. Oh, I'm sure he was in court. I yeah. don't know about the Supreme Court. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, the U.S. Attorney General does not have to be a member of the bar, and you don't hear FBI agents marching down Pennsylvania Avenue saying this is a, a really terrible thing. And, and Dennis, I have to say, it's sort of, you should not be using the term disability. And, and, and let me say this. This direct address thing that was put in the Constitution in 1874 is rooted in lunacy law. And when you go back and you read the case against the judge, they're talking about imbeciles and, and lunatics and idiots. This comes out of 19th century eugenic law. And it's appalling. There was actually in the early 1900s an Idiocy Prevention Act. They were going to sterilize every idiot in Pennsylvania, which would have been bad news for people in Pittsburgh, let's say, you know? So, well, okay, let's, 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 but, but let's, no, no, let's, let's let answer that a little bit here, too, because you know what else was rooted in the, eugenics, Bill? Yes, this was, this was a eugenic, this came out of the era of eugenics. It's based in lunacy law, Dennis. That's what this is, and to say that this is a disability, if we, you know, if we're talking about Pennhurst, if we're talking about the 68 convention, they weren't looking at this. This was forgotten for 100 years for a good reason. This led to mass sterilizations that already, that, there, there was an anniversary of this in 2012, the 75th anniversary of the, of the Buck v. Bell case, where they legalized sterilizations. Five states have apologized. Pennsylvania and Virginia were the main states, and they're in denial about this. So this is what we're talking about. And, and Bill, in 68, just let I? me finish, in 68, a real reform was that judges should be retired at the age of 70. And so now these guys, in the middle of this pornographic email scandal, they're, they're asking for a waiver of this. Voters will go and, and let them stay on until 75. Well, that countermands what was going on in 1968. So, you know, we really have to be careful about, uh, about talking about disabilities when we're talking about this. We have to be talk careful about talking about 1968. We have to be careful about talking about a lot of this stuff and be a little bit more thoughtful about it. Dennis, this is not a disability. This is a law license. And people every day get up without a law license and function quite well. Scarnati in the Senate was I'm saying, we, we have a great stock in Barber's license. Bill, let me interrupt and give Dennis a chance to respond, please. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay, Bill, first of all, many things are rooted in old uh, theories that then become adapted uh, to the later dates. Did you take, did you take the, the SATs, Bill? Did you take the college boards? No, I didn't. Because those, those were rooted in eugenic theory. Uh, that's how they first emerged. Uh, they came out of army eugenics tests that, uh, that sought metal, uh, metal uh, defect. And as we came to understand, as we came to understand things, we adapted them to our times. For instance, in 1968, they again placed that clause in the state constitution. Now, you can be disabled mentally, you can be disabled physically, you can be disabled legally. In other words, 
A disability basically implies an inability to do something. Like practice law, Bill. Like practice law. This is not a grand eugenic scheme. This is, uh, this is simply the fact that we no longer live in the 19th century, but we do understand that when you can't do something, you shouldn't be in charge of it. Well, you know, the SATs actually are being pushed aside. The intelligence tests you're talking about from the early 19th century are being pushed aside. If, if, you, if you study this whole period, there's a, a lot of controversy about that. But let me just say this, Scarnati, Senator Scarnati kept bringing up, well, you need to have a license in this state to cut hair. All right, well, you lose your barber's license, but you probably still know how to cut hair. You know, and I, I think this goes to what Mr. What Walter is saying here, that you don't lose your, your, whether you're learned in law, and I think that's the, I think that's the appropriate catchphrase here. Well, Walter, Great, well, I'll get our hair cut at Sweeney Todd's shop. Uh, Walter, what specific portions of the Attorney General's job is she currently prevented from doing because of her, of her license suspension? Uh, I think she cannot, uh, it's basically she can't go to court. She can't sign legal documents that are filed with court. Uh, and and th there's a, an issue related to warrants that, that need to be signed or, or just plain briefs and uh, indictments, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that the office can't do that. That's what is done all the time by, and can be done by the first deputy, by the executive deputies, the chief deputies, all the deputies, attorneys general in uh, I think 20 offices around the state now. If something is happening up in Erie in their office there, uh, she doesn't have to be there. She's not there. And uh, she handles issues related to, uh, she can uh, ha handle all kinds of operational issues, administrative issues, hiring and firing, hiring outside special counsel. I mean, in a sense, the argument is she can't hire this lawyer uh, because she doesn't have a license. She can't hire Doug Gansler, former Attorney General of Maryland. Uh, yet, she's hiring him, you, you could argue, because he is a lawyer and she wants somebody who's a lawyer to do some investigative work. You were invited to testify at yesterday's hearing and declined. Why did you decide not to participate? Uh, I met with the chairman of the committee an hour before the hearing and he uh, indicated to me that they did not want to hear uh, what I was planning to testify about. I was planning to say that I've had contact with uh, eight different deputies, attorneys, general, uh, many of whom were there before, uh, most of whom were there before Kathleen Kane got there, will be there after she leaves, whenever that is. Uh, and they are functioning well. They are doing their jobs and they are making decisions. And I'm meeting with them representing clients and I don't always like all the decisions they make. Uh, but that's their job to represent the Commonwealth. My job is to represent my clients and we do that and we do that in a very civil capacity and the office functions. The office may not be the most pleasant, comfortable place to work. Uh, but you know, it's, it's not comfortable in Afghanistan either. I mean, it's it's a problem that is unfortunate for the people that are there, but that doesn't mean that the office doesn't operate and that she can't do uh, most of what she does and can't do maybe some of the things she might have done in the past. But again, she can make decisions that are policy in nature, and that's what Ed Rendell was saying. Uh, she just can't make uh, legal representations to the courts. You were acting Attorney General in, I believe, 95 when Ernie Pree resigned. From your experiences, what do you think the environment in the Attorney General's office is like right now? Uh, I think that it is probably not, I mean, I would guess, in fact, that if you're a Deputy Attorney General and you meet people and they say, what do you do, and that's a common thing, and whether, you, you know, wherever you meet them or even your friends uh, and you say, I work in the Attorney General's office, they say, oh my God. How can you work there? I mean, it, it's not a pleasant environment. I did deal with that. I was a first deputy. I was a law school friend of Ernie Prieta's. I was a close friend of his. And uh, I didn't ever intend to be first deputy. I had headed his transition operation, and I failed in the job of finding a first deputy. And I decided to do it uh, for a period of time, and it ended up being uh, six and a half years. And at the end, uh, one of the things I had to deal with on a constant basis was the uh, disruption in the office. Now, it was very different because Ernie Priate, as soon as he pleaded guilty and he was not indicted, he had, there was a, cr a criminal information the day that he pleaded guilty and he resigned. All at once, gone. But 
Kathleen Kane has not been found guilty. She has been charged. And, and I want to say something about that, too, that nobody talks about, okay? Kathleen Kane's underlying offense is leaking a document involving a grand jury from 2009, okay? That's wrong. Happens all the time uh, in prosecutors' offices. And the reason I bring it up is when the Montgomery County uh, grand jury issued a presentment recommending criminal charges against Kathleen Kane and sent it to the district attorney of Montgomery County. That document in 2014, I guess it was, maybe it was 15, that document was leaked to the Philadelphia Inquirer. That is the same level of crime. I would argue it's a more serious crime because it's current. And no one has ever said, hey, we ought to investigate that. Hey, how'd that happen? Who did that? Nobody has done that. And the district attorney of Montgomery County brought the criminal charges, uh, and that's, that's where this is proceeding. I don't mean to belittle uh, the commission of a criminal offense, but I'm just saying let's be consistent in how we prosecute the same level of crime. I, I think we need, though, that. to be... <laughs> Go ahead, Dennis. Go ahead. I, I, think, I think we also need to be clear, though, that what Kathleen Kane is charged with is two counts of perjury. Okay, that, that, that is a crime that really goes to character. And, and, and a law license, by the way, is supposed to attest to one's character. For instance, Stephen Glass can't get one out in California uh, because of, of, of his non-criminal activity in, in, in making up stories in the New Republic. So let's keep in mind, what Kathleen Kane's charged with is not leaking, it's perjury. Well, so Dennis, that, that's correct. But I said the underlying crime is the leaking of the grand jury documents. Well, we, you, you know, one of, one of the reasons why I'm a fan of Walter Cohen's is the, the, the guy is careful and he's fair. And the reason why we protect people in the grand jury, we're, we're protecting them, right? We're trying to protect them. They're innocent, they're guilty, we're trying to protect them. We're also trying to protect people who go to trial and I, I just don't think we can sort through and say we got to protect these people, but we can't protect these people. You know, so there is an underlying fairness thing. I should say, as a writer, I'm appalled with everything that's going down there with this leak. Because here you have a reporter from the Daily News calling one of the prosecutors and basically turning Kane in. We're supposed to be protecting our sources, not burning them, is, is, is what happened there. So I, I, hear, Wait a second, I, I hear what you're Bill, saying, You're saying Dennis, that Chris Brennan then, handed over a source? He, he called the prosecutor involved. In, I, you know, I haven't been getting into the personalities. He called one of the prosecutors and read verbatim what had been given to him, and it led to these charges. Yes, I think that, that I've been in a similar position, and I would never do something like that. I think that's very so careless, you, very unprofessional. And now, and now you have a source that's going to jail. And, and Bill, that's, Bill. that's something every writer in Pennsylvania should be concerned about. Bill. Bill, should he not have called them, just let them be surprised in the newspaper? I mean, aren't you supposed to verify these things? Dennis, he had a road a You know, when I wrote that book about patronage at the turnpike, we can get into patronage at the attorney general's office. Well, I got a whole stack of things, right and I didn't call up the lawyers of the turnpike and read them verbatim. He had the road map there to, to proceed with his story. I don't think he handled this at all well, and it's appalling. It truly is. Now, you want to go to the, the patronage issue, I, I think one of the things Kane is looking at Let's, here in the office, and I understand that Mr. Beamer has had a long career, but she really can't depend on these people because they're, they're holdovers from the last office. If she had fired everybody when she came in, I think she, she'd be in much better shape. Well, let's give the yeah. a chance to respond, please. Yeah, look, I can tell you, as a reporter, Bill, you're supposed to call all people involved in the story. You need to be open and upfront about what it is you're doing. Uh, that's obviously that's going to tell them you that you acquired a particular I'm document. Sorry. You're about to publish that fact in the newspaper. That's not giving up your source. And and I think you know uh, the differences I've had with Chris Brennan over the years could could fill uh, one of your books. But the fact is, 
you're being unfair to Chris in, in saying this. This is, this is a terrible thing to say about a reporter. He didn't give up his source. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It, 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 it's, a, it's appalling what it is they've done down there. Well, Dennis, you, for, for viewers that may not recall, you had a decades-long career as a reporter, particularly in the Pittsburgh area. In your estimation, how would you characterize her relationship with the media, and do you think that the media has covered her fairly? The media created Kathleen Kane. She was the darling. Everybody bought into this theory about Sandusky uh, case uh, being delayed, even though Corbett was the only person who actually took it on. Uh, and and so and so uh, she was. She uh, the expectations were so high. She was made such a star that it was bound to start to unravel. But the fact is, uh, the the story that was published on March sixteenth of two thousand. 14, I guess it was, uh, in the Philadelphia Inquirer about the abandoned sting story. You know, she could have let that alone. She could have said, this was my decision, this is why I thought this, and then let it alone. But no. She said, this is war. And so she began to go after people that she imagined must have been the source of the information. That's the, that's, that's the origin of her problem. Her problems with the press stem from the fact that sometimes you're going to win in coverage, sometimes you're going to lose, but if you declare war, uh, win or lose, you're going to take casualties, and now she's one of them. No. Long ago in the 80s when I was working on the book about Roy Zimmerman, I, I had a nice interview with Jim West, who was the acting U.S. attorney. And I was talking to him, this was the Bud Dwyer prosecution, why wasn't this person prosecuted? Why? And, and a, 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 turn, a U.S. attorney, West, says to me, uh, trying to figure out why a case isn't prosecuted is like nailing jello to the wall. All right, and that's always been good advice to me. And I thought this was harebrained from the start. And 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 Dennis, I don't know when when people come to me as a writer, it's not about retaliation or grinding an axe. It's to tell their side of the story, you know. And 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 so you're putting what happened with Kane here in this newspaper, this really distressed, troubled newspaper, what happened, and 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 trying to present it in, in legalese terms that she was retaliating. She was trying to tell her side of the story, you know? And again, I've gotten packets of information. If I were to get a packet of information from a grand jury, I would have the sense not to call the grand jury judge or lawyer about it. That's a road map that you, that you then use to go out. It was mishandled by the Daily News. Now their source is in criminal straits. I, don't, I think she was trying to tell her story. I would have nothing to do with either the Inquirer or the Daily News. I think they're bad. She news. wasn't trying to tell her story story she was trying to tell a bad story about Frank Fina she could have her, let that's the whole the thing about go the ahead, sting well, I, go but she imagined it was Frank Fina to blame so she wanted to get even I think uh, that's Dennis, not telling her story Dennis I think you've given a very good analysis of how this whole thing started and it, it certainly could have been avoided as Attorney General, it made no sense for her to get in a fight with somebody who was a former Deputy Attorney General. I mean, Attorney General, if you want to fight with somebody, fight with the Governor, fight with the President, uh, fight with the President of the Senate, wh whatever, but don't fight with a former Deputy Attorney General. Uh, why she did that, uh, I, I don't know. And, and that is what started the, the whole problem for her. She could have and she should have just referred all those cases to the Ethics Commission. I believe that that is the kind of thing that Tom Corbett would have done because there was very small amounts of money overall and it involved a, a uh, source, the, the person who was the witness against those legislators had been charged with a $450,000 fraud against the Department of Education and those charges were dropped in return for his helping with this and that would have been a difficult case to prove those cases have not gone to court, the legislators did plead. I'm not saying they didn't do it, but I think uh, it was just unfortunate that she got so wrapped up in that issue. Dennis, uh, you invoked the name of Frank Fina for the benefit of our, our viewers at home that are following along. Can you remind us who he is and what her relationship was with him? Well, Frank Fina was the uh, uh, probably the most celebrated prosecutor in that office at the time. He oversaw in particular the bonus gate investigations. He also oversaw uh, much of the Jerry Sandusky investigation. Uh, he, uh, he basically was, was known as a straight shooting kind of uh, 
hard as nails, uh, no nonsense kind of prosecutor. Uh, and um, he clearly did not appreciate uh, uh, Kathleen Kane suggesting that somehow he had slow walked the Jerry Sandusky investigation. Uh, and there's never been really a credible account that makes it appear so. Uh, but uh, uh, he resigned, but before, res before leaving, uh, the office, he informed her about this investigation in Philadelphia and said he had referred it to the FBI because one of the people involved in her campaign had come up in the course of this investigation and he thought that would be a conflict. Uh, he left and from there the investigation, uh, uh, the sting investigation uh, was dead in the water. It never proceeded. Now before we run out of time, the Attorney General's uh Communications officer Chuck Ardo said that she intends on running for re-election. Can she legally do so, and what would prevent her from doing so? I think that will ultimately be up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Somebody will raise it. The court will have to decide it. Uh, she is a member of the bar, and that's the requirement, but that license has been suspended temporarily. In your estimation, what are the political odds of her, her re-election campaign? I think they're doing a good job to promote Kathleen Kane, and I, you know, they could, they could put her in the U.S. Senate if they keep pushing it. I, I think people smell a rat. What Dennis is talking about with Fina and everybody else should have been in an impeachment hearing. We should get the whole truth out. This thing stinks to high heaven, and and I think they're promoting Kathleen Kane. I think they're falling into a trap, and God bless them. Dennis, I hope they never try to promote me. Then uh, look. What, what, we're, what we're going to then, uh, the conclusion we would seem to have reached here is that she can serve in an office that she cannot, under law, be elected to in the current circumstances. I, I, don't, I don't think this augurs well for Pennsylvania. What would the aftermath be if the, the sentiment and sent, Senate and ultimately the governor were to remove her from office? I would expect that she would uh, bring that to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and they ultimately will decide the law is what the court says it is. Well, I was asking. He should have impeached. I was at, the, the interesting thing is when you look at the 19th century, the Attorney General, the, the 1885 case, it said the Attorney General will determine the constitutionality of this. The 1891 case, the Attorney General pre presided over it. So wh what I've been thinking about the last few weeks is can the Attorney General issue an opinion saying this is unconstitutional and would it be binding on the governor? That's what I asked Walter. Has well, we're not there yet. Has Governor Wolf indicated if the Senate were to go through and they get the two-thirds uh, decision to remove her, will Governor Wolf? I, I think he initially said that he uh, would remove her, and then he said, well, he'd have to assess it at that time. The language, as I recall it in the Constitution, is that uh, uh, the Senate, upon a two-thirds vote, shall direct the governor to remove the office holder for reasonable cause. So it would be an order from the Senate, he would either do it and say, I mean, he would either do it and say, I've been directed under the Constitution, or he might ask the Supreme Court for guidance on what he should do, or he might decide, I'm not going to remove her, and then I would expect the Senate would bring that issue to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. So what's next in the procedure? How long does the Senate have? When do you expect some next step to occur? I think the, I think the Senate has 15 days. I, I'm not sure whether that's just a self-imposed limit uh, to make a decision. They've given her until Friday if she wants to submit any additional information. And then there has to be a vote of the full Senate. It requires a two-thirds vote of the members. I don't know. There are 49 members. There should be 50. There's one vacancy. Whether it's two-thirds of 49 or two-thirds of 50, that doesn't really make much of a difference. It will require both Republican and Democratic senators to vote uh, to get a two-thirds majority. Dennis, what will you be watching as this process continues to, to move on? Uh, well, if there's, another, if there's another season of Fargo, I'll probably watch that. Uh, but um, in terms of uh, how, this, how this will proceed, look, mark my word, Kane's going to organize or arrange some other kind of release of materials and information. It has been, it has been nothing but uh, a circus of distractions thrown up different places uh, to, to get away from the one question, and that is whether an attorney general charged with two counts of perjury and 
uh, temporarily barred from the practice of law can hold this office. That's what it's going to come down to, but uh, heaven knows the kinds of distractions uh, that are going to be thrown out there. Well, and also I'd point out this isn't being done in a political vacuum. You have a primary election coming up. You have, Wolf is a Democrat. I think Kane does have a lot of support, particularly among women. So there, there, there could be blowback on this. The constitutional phrase is, shall be removed by the governor on address of two thirds of the Senate. So the lawyers can fight that out about what that means. It's, it's really fascinating, but I, I really think there should have been a broader investigation in the House dealing with the FINA stuff, the email stuff, and I think that's part of what the blowback of this is going to be. The cane has been railroaded without due process. And that's really where I'm coming from. It's not a personal affection for Kathleen Kane. It's an affection for due process of law and fairness here. And I think this could blow up big time on people if they're not careful. Well, so I'll give you the, the, the final word before we run out of time. What will you be focusing on as this procedure uh, continues to work its way through the process? Very hard to say that. Uh, the, the playing field shifts uh, practically every day. I, I think that uh, I suspect the Senate will act to move forward, and there probably will be a two-thirds uh, majority. And ultimately, I will look at the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Very hard to predict, uh, even from the opinion of the five justices, and I guess there only are, are two of them who are left on the court, uh, or three of them who are left on the court. Uh, to um, suspend her license, whether the current uh, court would feel that that's some kind of a precedent or there'll be new facts, that it, very hard to predict, but very interesting to watch. Very yeah. unpleasant environment uh, for the people that are working day to day in that office. We are out of time. I'd like to thank our guest, Walter Cohn, partner with Oprah Mayor Redmond, Maxwell, and Hipple, Bill Kiesling, writer for Newslink.com and Dennis Brody, member of the firm Cold Spark Media. Gentlemen, thank you all for joining us. I'm Francine Scherzer. Thank you for watching.